the Stronger After Stroke podcast. I'm your host, Rosa Hart, the Stroke Nurse Navigator for Norton Healthcare. And today joining me is Ify Whitfield, uh, a young stroke survivor who is the epitome of resilience. And um, she has a really special story that I would love for you to hear. And so um, Ify, strokes just come on suddenly, but in your case, you feel like you had premonitions. So could you describe the way you felt in the days and weeks leading up to your stroke? Sure, thank you so much, Rosa. And that was such a lovely introduction of me. I appreciate that. Um, so about a week before I had my stroke, I started feeling like something was gonna happen. Like so I just had this eerie feeling that would just come over me all of a sudden. And it happened a few times. And then finally, um, I kind of s slowed down a second and listened to that. And I felt like like I was gonna die, basically. I felt like I was getting a premonition that mm. I was gonna die. Um, and I was just, you know, really panicked by that, but also just sort of put it out of my mind, like that's kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But I remember sharing it with uh, my husband at the time and saying to him, you know, like, this is, this is what I'm feeling. And, you know, of course he's like, okay, yeah, whatever. You're just being kind of extreme. Like that's, you know, I'm healthy. Like there's no reason and why I should feel that can way. Can you tell how old you were at the I time? Was, I was 33 at the time. Mm. Um, That's pretty young. Yeah, it is. So, of course, you know, I, I went to the, and I told you this, that, <laughs> you know, I went to the, the Christ complex of like, he died at 33. I think a lot of people feel like they might die at 33. Uh -oh. and yeah. I don't know if that's a thing, but I have read it somewhere. So yeah. I was like, maybe that's what's going on, that I, I can't see my <laughs> life beyond that point. Mm -hmm. um, you were not thinking stroke. I was not. Not at all. <laughs> of course not. No, because... I was an athlete and so, and I've always been healthy and I take care of myself. And so I would have no reason to think that. Um, but then about a few days after that happened, I then had the feeling that I wasn't gonna die, but something really bad was gonna happen. Hmm. And then after you had a stroke, um, how, let's see, do you wanna tell us about your story of what happened, what stroke symptoms you experienced? Mm -hmm. Um, so actually, I think mine was a little bit of an anomaly because I didn't have, I think some people will have like, you know, the, was it the fast symptoms, I guess, mm -hmm. or like the, the loss of left side and all of that, the drooping of the face, um, the blurred speech. And I had all those things, but I had them immediately. Mm, um, so it once. wasn't, yeah, all at once. It wasn't like one day I had this symptom and the next day this happened or a few hours later, this happened. It was, um, I was actually at a pool with my kids and with my family and I was getting ready. And I remember reaching down and picking up a bag and putting it in the locker. And then I looked back down and the bag was still there. So it was really strange. Like it was like my brain thought I had oh, done this wow. because I remember picking it up. But then so I was like, like I guess... when you dream you've done something and you wake up and no, I didn't do that. Exactly. It was like mm. deja vu maybe, but it was just really eerie. And I just thought nothing of it. I think at this point, maybe my cognition wasn't the best. Mm. Um, and so I remember reaching for the bag again and my hand did this instead of, you know, the regular clasp. Oh. And that, and even that, I was like, well, that's weird, but I still was able to clasp it. So I picked it up like this, threw it in the locker. And this is what, this is when I realized my daughter was talking to me and I was talking, I was responding to her and she said, mommy, you're talking funny. And as I was talking, I didn't realize it, but when she said that immediately, I was like, I'm having a stroke. Wow. And I don't, like the the premonitions and I just feel like something or someone was like telling me like, here's what's happening, like be prepared. And in that moment, it was like immediate thought. And um, I looked over across the room, two women were walking into the, to the changing room and I walked over to them and I said, I'm having a stroke. And as I said that, I lost complete um, function of my left side and fell onto the bench. And yeah, so I was just glad that I knew or that something put in my mind that it was a stroke. Because I don't really know that much about strokes before I had one. I just knew that it was a really bad thing and it was related to clots and mm -hmm. that was about it. Yeah, and so they did they call 911? They actually, there was an ambulance there because there was a swim meet going on. What? And so I was very lucky. They yeah. were on site. They were on site. I was like, I couldn't have asked for a better solution because I lived about 45 minutes or, well, yeah, 40, 45 minutes from downtown at the time. So I happened to be about 15 minutes from downtown mm. when this happened. So I was like, this couldn't have happened in a more perfect scenario. I feel like I was very, very lucky in that case. For timing. And then yes. um, when you got to the hospital, what did they do? Um, so the funny thing is when I got to, not funny, but I was like, why are you cutting my clothes off? Like, is this necessary? Because like I said, I didn't know anything about stroke. Yeah. I didn't know you could die from a stroke even. No. I had yeah. no idea. I was just like, something you hear about that happens to old people. Right. That's what I thought. 
or um and you never so, imagined yourself in that scenario exactly yeah. so i'm like why are you like i'm just having a stroke like okay like it's gonna like it's just a thing that passes or something i don't know <laughs> i don't know no. obviously i said my cognition yeah. wasn't great um so i got there they um they then did a ct scan uh, with contrast and they found the clot because they didn't want to do anything and i'm like why are you doing all these tests like clearly i'm having a stroke not realizing that there's other things that that mimic it mm -hmm. um yes. and so then they gave me uh the clot busting drug tpa mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. and um yeah so that's that's what they did after they did the array of tests to make sure that's exactly what it was. So. Yes, because you can have a hemorrhagic stroke with similar mm -hmm. symptoms, but it's a bleed in the brain and they don't want to give you a blood thinning agent right. on top of already bleeding that will just make it worse. So exactly, I'm exactly. glad to hear you got such great care. And then um, do you remember your uh, body coming back to life? Um, I actually remember the opposite just real quick oh. um because it was really strange that i was trying to move my hand mm -hmm. and that's one of the things they ask you to do like mm -hmm. grasp something and i was just like why isn't it doing it and i just remember that so i can't imagine what that would have felt like to feel that way for like an extended period of time because i re i received function back to my limbs and my my arm um within 24 hours so I know it was it was pretty late in the day at this point and so the next morning when i woke up i could move my hand again mm. so but like i said i I didn't realize how severe it was. Um, I guess I never thought like I wouldn't move again or anything like that. Like, I didn't have any of the fears that came with stroke because I was completely ignorant to what the, <laughs> what the uh, consequences are of having a stroke or what the what the uh, after effects are of having a stroke. And so I was just completely oblivious and which would have been probably even more devastating to realize that I'm now you know, paralyzed or something when I never even knew that was a possibility for my life, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm very lucky in the fact that I didn't have to um, experience that. Mm -hmm. So have all of your symptoms gone away? Um, I would say for the most part, I mean, there's things like that I see or that I recognize that others don't. Mm -hmm. um, my smile is kind of crooked and I, I've gone back to like pictures prior to stroke and I'm like, was it like that before? You know, like maybe it's just in my head that I think it's that way, but it was very prominent immediately after, but I still think it's a little bit lagging mm. um, on the left side. And I have a very weak left arm, like weaker than before, because I'm right-handed mm -hmm. and I'll just so like So obviously your left arm would and... be weak if it's not dominant. Anyway. Exactly, exactly. And it's just more pronounced now, so. Um... And I'll just trip every now and then, like oh random things, and you know, well, or I trip have issues but... with speaking um, or remembering people's names or mm -hmm. saying things, and so, and a lot of that I didn't even realize that was related to my stroke. So, mm. or could be related to my stroke. I just, you know, didn't really get a lot of uh, hair after the fact because I looked so normal mm. and behaved so normal. So normal. You know? Yeah. So, do you think that? Um it's easy for people to not think you had a stroke by looking at you exactly exactly and my age too you know I'm, yeah. I'm very young so i think like i said it's an it's an i hate to say old people that sound pc mm -hmm. but it's an it's something that happens to people who are older typically yeah. is what people think um they don't they don't see a lot of younger um, people who are experiencing that haven't come in contact but it seems like i've actually heard more people having strokes at younger ages and I'm you know wondering why that is now but I've know several that have had strokes in their 30s I had a friend whose son had a stroke at age eight yeah and unfortunately children didn't. can have strokes pregnant women are at an increased risk for stroke so See, I yeah I didn't know that either well that makes mm -hmm. sense though with clotting and mm -hmm. everything else and heart health in general yeah. affects all that mm -hmm. so um you said you were really active and healthy so what's something that you saw as a difference from your own own perception um, versus how you were athletic before that someone else may not pick up on right yeah so right before I had my stroke and I I'm I was a runner I ran track and field but I actually don't like running or I didn't <laughs> like running I don't um, like running I was a sprinter so I was about like you know and a jumper so I, I liked that but I didn't like just go for runs okay but strangely enough about two years before my stroke I started running and I, I enjoyed it it was really fun and I was like, you know, I loved it. And so, but after my stroke, um, I couldn't run anymore um, because even though I can walk, it looks like I'm walking normally, 
I, I realized when I was running that I was kind of dragging my left leg. Oh. And so I remember I was running down the street one day and I noticed it and I was like, okay, so I like try to pick it up more. So I was like physically thinking in my head, like pick it up more and put your knee over and like mm -hmm. cycle your leg up. Like I was mentally thinking about moving my leg in a mechanical way that would stop it from dragging, mm -hmm. but it was just more work. And then I got more injuries because obviously I'm dragging and the right legs having to do more work. And oh yeah, so the overcompensating. Like, well, yeah, exactly. With the other side to try to look and act normal. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that just, that was just too painful. And I was like, well, I guess I'll go back to elliptical, which is what I was always prescribed to do because I had bad knees. And I was like, I can actually, I like I'm enjoying running. So I wanted to do it again. And so that's kind of sad for me sometimes that I can't ever pick that back up. and without a lot of ailments. Well, do you, uh, so in order to regain function, you can go to things like physical therapy, occupational and speech therapy. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that since you are younger, you were less aware of those options? Definitely. Um, like I alluded to earlier, I didn't really get a comprehensive care because I, I seemed so normal. Mm -hmm. um, I shouldn't say comprehensive care. They did all the checks that they were supposed to do, mm -hmm. but my symptoms or my residual effects were so minimal compared to people who suffer massive strokes or have more adverse reactions to um, the complications from stroke, I should say, um, that I think from a screening, like I wasn't, I didn't hit on the radar for that. Um, so I wonder if there's one for like younger people specifically. <laughs> Somebody should do some research on that Well, for young stroke survivors and have yeah. a different screening that maybe doesn't have as high of a threshold for some of these things. And so, yeah, I do think that I missed the opportunity of being able to, you know, participate in occupational therapy well, you or physical still therapy. Can, and, by the way, yes. if you are years after your stroke, which at this point has been seven years. Yes. Is that right? Um, so you can still ask your primary care provider for an order to be evaluated for physical, occupational, or speech therapy or any other specialized therapy you may need because, um, like, that's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't have to be hospitalized to get an order for that. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize. They think you have to go to the hospital to get that attention. And so it is something you can ask for. I'm really glad you brought that up, actually, yeah. because... Um, after living this way for seven years after my stroke, um, I just didn't know I could get these things. Like I didn't know that I could have access to these things. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. Well, and I think that in our conversation when we met and were introduced, um, I think it was really important. And that's why we decided to do this episode together to talk about the struggle younger stroke survivors have in admitting where you're at and asking for help because um, especially for those of us who are like the breadwinner or the caregiver in our family, uh, we don't want to come across as, um, what would you say? You don't want to come across as? Well, maybe needy, but mm, as an mm -hmm. athlete too, I'm very competitive and mm. I'm like, I don't want to be not only a burden, but I don't want to be weak, you know? And so internally I'm like, you wanna I want to be, yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, I can beat this. Like I can do this. I don't need anybody else to help me, you know, which is not always the best mind. Well, never the best mindset when you're struggling with something because yeah. you do need help and you, you can't always do it on your own and it feels lonely. And so, um, I really had to let that go, that mindset of trying to do it on my own and realize that people do want to help and that help is there and, you know, just having a completely different mindset and seeking that, seeking that help. Yeah. And it's all the more important when you have no visible need that people can just automatically guess what you might need. Um, if you also have that inhibition of, uh, being afraid to ask for what you need or admit that you need something um, because, yeah, so I think that's a very important layer to address for young stroke survivors and those who we want to help get back to your peak performance. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can do that with a little coaching from <laughs> physical therapist. Because <laughs> maybe if we think of it as coaching, is that helpful? Yeah. Maybe yeah, it is. It is. Is it? Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's a little bit of like, I want to say, I want, I'm going to say, okay. 
Say it. There's a little bit of arrogance that goes with being an athlete. Oh, okay. You know, in terms of like, I'm better than other people. Oh. And I can, I don't need any help and I, I can make this happen on my own. I mean, maybe because I ran track and I was not like really a team sport. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's different than like, you know, team sports most... where you have to work together and things. But yeah. like as a track athlete, it's like I'm beating everybody, including everybody on my team, you know? Oh, And so there's yeah, a very a much like, mindset. I have to be the best and I am the best and I'm going to show you, you know? And so I, I want. Mm. I, don't, I wonder how much that played into me not seeking help, mm -hmm. along with the fact that I don't have the symptoms. And I think people like didn't want to help uh, to be honest, because they're so like, if you don't ask, well, they what's don't wrong have to. with you? <laughs> well, no, also just kind of like, what's wrong with you? Like nothing's wrong. Like they don't see anything wrong. Uh -huh. And so like you're capable because I just saw you do all these other things. Like, mm -hmm. And that really happened more in the home, I think. Mm. I wish that there was or I wish I knew more back then, or I wish things were different in terms of that um, there was understanding from like family members of mm -hmm. just because I seem normal, like I'm still struggling. And also knowing me, knowing that I am that overachiever and that I'm gonna <laughs> do it on my own, I'm probably gonna put on a facade that I'm good and I'm okay and I don't need help. But just understanding that that's not always gonna be the case and like being ready to like sort of sweep in and I know they have like support groups for family members of stroke survivors. And um, so I really recommend anybody that has a stroke that their family also attend these groups to understand the psyche behind like asking for help. Like, I don't think a lot of people want to be dependent on other people right too so maybe i take the arrogance statement back because it's more about depending on someone else and nobody wants that right like most people don't want to be a burden or yeah depend on someone else to do things for them and um but it may there's a be lot a of team factors sport. i'm saying yeah yeah it is a team sport it's a, recovering from stroke is a team approach it takes yeah. a village like we say it takes a village to raise a child yeah. it takes a village to heal sometimes just like if you have a baby and your church brings meals to your house yeah. or whatever uh, to show support and then to maybe see that you need a little help with your laundry or whatever like that. Yeah. Um, it's okay to let your community come around you and meet you where you're at and then um, you can get to an even stronger place where you can feel more independent as well. But yeah. um, do you feel like that's something you would like other stroke survivors to know? Yeah, I do. Um, that's really important that you don't feel alone and that you feel like you have people to support you. And I know there's a lot of different groups that, here in town and Norton has several um, support groups that you can participate in because I think particularly for people who suffer stroke that are like me who don't have um, visible or obvious symptoms, it can be difficult to feel like you're worthy of receiving some of these services and that you deserve to receive it because you see people, I went to an event and there was a gentleman there and he was in a wheelchair and couldn't speak very well, um, really at all. And I just thought like, who am I to want services or who am I to like be sitting here feeling sorry for myself when this gentleman can't even walk, you know, or speak. And I'm sitting in my room crying because nobody understands me. And it just made me feel like I wasn't deserving of, or that I don't, I should just be quiet and deal with it mm. because there's people who have it worse than me. And, um, that was a, not the best thought to have because everybody has different things and struggles that they have to deal with. And just because my symptoms aren't as, um, as uh, extreme, I guess, as other people's doesn't mean that I'm any less worthy of receiving care and I don't deserve to be understood or felt loved. And I, I shouldn't, I, nobody should feel alone, no matter how minor or extreme you perceive your symptoms or your, what is, it, what is the correct term for that? Residual? Symptoms? Yeah, your what residual is, symptoms. Residual yeah. symptoms to be. Um, and that was something I really learned with talking to Rosa, I was like, I didn't know this stuff was available, but I've been struggling and suffering alone, thinking I don't, I don't deserve it. But when I got it, I was like, wow, I needed that mm -hmm. for years. And I just stayed alone and stayed silent because I didn't feel like I deserved it, because I didn't want to be a burden, because I didn't, so many reasons basically that I've touched on a little bit here. And I wish that somebody had said to me like, you can get the help and you know, 
you do deserve it. And no matter what you're going through, if it's a tiny thing, even like there's other people there that want to support you and they're not going to judge you. I don't, I've never received judgment from another stroke survivor, no matter how extreme their residual symptoms are mm -hmm. that say, well, you shouldn't be even saying anything because you can still walk and you can still work and you can still, nobody's going to say that to you because we all understand the fear that came along with that moment when we had the stroke and like mm -hmm. what we all experience and that could easily have been me in that situation and I was just lucky because I got TPA quickly but if I hadn't maybe I would be in the same situation. Exactly you're absolutely right about that and if you let me thank you for being willing to use your voice to share your story because there are so many people that I encounter as a stroke nurse navigator who cannot talk and cannot speak to share their story so as much as you feel like you maybe shouldn't share your story, you could, I would think, say you're speaking for all those people who wish they could tell people what symptoms to watch for, or how important it is to get to the hospital on time, and how much it matters to have people ask to help you because maybe you don't have the nerve to ask for help yourself because you don't think you should. Yeah. Um, so you're giving a voice to other people who can't say these things, who might want to because they have aphasia. So I really appreciate your willingness to do that. Thank you. Thanks for putting that in perspective. Yeah. Can I hug you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> And stay tuned for the next episode of the Stronger After Stroke podcast for more great stories and talking about how to have a great life after a stroke. Thank you. Thank you.